Hello everyone. I'm Sally Neves from ISBA PNG. I'm the Integral Ecology Animator and with me is Sue Martin from Eco Jesuit. Hi Sally and Hi, it's Sue. great to be here with you. <laughs> we are um, we, we are co-leaders of the uh, CRA Ecology Alliance Committee and we've got a project to talk about which is Slow the Flow Ugaura as a way of responding to the Laudato Seagulls, Sue. And Sally, I love that uh, we're helping religious institutes thinking about their Laudato Sea journey and um, the seven Laudato Sea goals. And for us, this Slow the Flow Yugara meets all those goals. And so uh, it is sharing with you this project, but asking you to think about how your Laudato Sea journey is going in your institute. And for us, um, goal one, response to cry of the earth, our climate um, disasters and our climate impacts are only going to grow. And so it's a hope-filled future that we want to encourage and this project goal seven community engagement and participation is just so exciting so over to you sally thank you well in the institute of the sisters of mercy of australia and papua new guinea and uh, i was greeted recently out in Ugara by sister anne fole a sister of mercy and we are standing in this photo in a place where the water uh, really built up last November. Uh, November. At that time, uh, we were thinking about in the Institute how we could respond more deeply to practical actions on the ground in a kind of a bioregional way, as Indigenous people did, really, in the governance systems that we see in these, this language map. And thinking about even our own diocese as well, thinking about where we, we, where we are located is really important to pay attention to who are the ones keeping the rivers clean and flowing, responding to the local disasters and so on. Really uh, being integral ecologists. Sally. Exactly, exactly, Sue. So uh, this line from Mary Graham, an Indigenous woman up in Brisbane, instead of I think therefore I am, I am located therefore I am, many of us are starting to pay attention to this and to look really in our backyards, thinking about uh, the catchment or the bioregion as say the highest point of the, of the land, where the water is coming from and where it is going to. And all around us, what, who is keeping the air clean? Who is keeping the forests alive and the, and the water clean? And, and that interconnectedness. The interconnectedness of yeah. water, that life. Yeah. Even receiving most of our goods and services from the bioregion and the local area is um, way better off for us and for the planet. So this is the project that we're referring to. Uh, if you go a couple of kilo a couple of hundred kilometres to the west from Sydney, you'll find Ugara not far from Orange and not far from Forbes. Here it is again, um, Ugara is near Nanga National Park and the Mandadari Creek is the one that became really, really damaging to the township of Ugara last November. It was a rain bomb, wasn't it? It was a rain bomb and locals described it as a tsunami, a one in 5,000 year event. Um, and it came so fast, they had never, never experienced anything like it, although Ugara does often flood. So this was a completely different experience. The waters came from different directions and people had very little warning. Normally they would have, you know, between five and seven hours of warning. This time they only had an hour and a half. And this is what it looks like from an aerial view. Uh, you can see the Mandatory Creek in red. The circle, the red circle is where the town is. And all of that water is coming from those bereft sections, bereft of vegetation, where it was able to speed up, it headed through those two hills that are vegetated still, um, but there was nothing much, as you can see, for the water to slow down. Oh, Sally, this is really seeing the signs of the times. And for me, uh, uh, 
coming from an agronomist background, really looking there and seeing the landscape and trying to really understand. And you can see the trees are gone. And so for us, even knowing that we have to work on landscape restitution and tree planting, Sally. Mm. Yeah, people with the local knowledge are telling me those are the two problem areas and you can see that it's to do with a lot of cropping and a lot of grazing. So this is um, what the creek is normally like. Uh, after the floods, some locals, you can see on the tree, there is a marker on the tree way above mm -hmm. the normal flood gauge. That's the level that it went to. This is what it looked like, that tiny little creek few images from some of the damage. These are mostly church buildings and um, the school. Devastation. This is how um, the town is starting to recover. It's basically at this stage where if the building still exists, the floors have been removed and, and totally gutted in order to make way for the rebuild. This is Janet who is 88 years old. She, I met her because I left my handbag behind and I had the most extraordinary experience. Her story is she was clinging to a curtain rail, uh, standing on a table, for five hours and the water was up to her chest, even on at that height. So she was very lucky to survive. She was rescued but shortly after that, her house was physically washed away. So she now lives in Orange. So for our project that we're looking at the whole catchment for, um, these are some of the people that we've had to engage in order to um, find a way in to support the community. You can see there's a lot of landholders, CWA, Red Cross, um, Catholic Parish, the um, Reconstruction New South Wales, the state institution, uh, the council, uni, um, land care, progress association and Central West Environment Council. All of these stakeholders are really critical for finding a way forward in an entire catchment. The Sally, idea... I, I just, I just want to share that that's so nice that uh, the Mercies see this as where church can be. And it's that collaboration and conversation across all those agencies. I, I just think that's really exciting for us as church. So, Yeah, thanks, Sue. And actually, that's what I've heard from them as well, that this has been recognised by groups such as council. They see an important and unique role for church. Um, so the idea originally came from the church for me because a conversation from our diocese that they were intending to be part of this this group that were relocating housing out of the floodplain however we we did think more broadly than that and started to think how can we restore the natural function of creeks to buffer against flood and drought and fire and so on into the future and that means sinking slowing and spreading the water and also we thought, how can we maybe, maybe make this into a lighthouse project to demonstrate best practice for future disasters, which will be going on. The rolling disasters are expected in the future everywhere. So um, because of connections with the uh, Canberra Goulburn Diocese, I was able to meet uh, Tim and Ash Wright, who have been landholders for many generations there. And you can see the picture on the left was how it was 20 years ago on their farm. Um, pretty bereft of vegetation again, but um, on the right is what it looks like today. The only thing that is recognisable is a little bit of the hill in the background. And that's because of the work that's being done to regenerate. This fence separates their place from the neighbours. On the neighbours' side, you can see those deep incisions of where the creek has formed. Um, but if I play this, you can see back in their part of the paddock, you can see how the um, those incisions are starting to soften. Also, I can see in there some native grasses restored into the catchment, into the into the the part of the creek bed, and all they have done to make that happen was to make those trees in the background there uh, grow, able to grow 
and over 20 years, that's what's happened. There are processes in place now to speed that up as well. So, so landscapes can uh, recover. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So, um, yeah, again, uh, we've been part of this already, a little bit of land care to respond to flood disasters in a whole other way than just in the human community. But in the human community, this is what it looks like right now. So lots of dongers, lots of temporary buildings still. That's the school, um, admin block at the school. But we have to remember that before Europeans arrived in Australia, this is the sort of thing we would have seen. Lots of water stored in the landscape and vegetation protecting that water. But really listening to our First Nations and understanding how they trod gently. Mm. Chains of ponds, swampy meadows is how it was described. So that, as we can see in these diagrams, this is what it was like. Lots of vegetation and native animals that weren't damaging. Uh, in the dry times, the water flow remained beneath the surface and it was protected under there, connecting the chains of ponds. And in wet times, the water was able to soak in and spread like a sponge. And those, all of that vegetation is important because that is storing and, and enabling the water to sink right in. Sally, it might be nice to also just mention that they, these are still productive farmlands. Mm. Very it's much not so, it's yeah. not changing uh it's not saying that we're changing um it, farming but it's just changing to understand landscape where farming is happening isn't it that's right so the farming practices that have been mainstream for a long time when they came in you can see in this image that the that the stock are coming right into the creek there's fewer paddock trees. In fact, in Yugara, a lot of paddock trees were just snapped and washed away because they're on their own. And the incisions are cutting deep into those soils um, and even deeper. So the water becomes faster and more destructive. I was lucky to meet Therese Welsh, who's been regenerating some of her creeks. Uh, she did point out some of the some of the um, damage from the disaster as well. Uh, obviously, that sort of water is extremely destructive where there is little vegetation. But in some parts of her farm, she has actually fenced off the creeks. I can see there a lot of lamantra grasses that are very, very strong, indestructible against those um, high force waters and also the Phragmites reeds that are cleaning the water as well. Neighbours of hers had had a lot of damage, like four times the width of the creek, but this one stayed intact. So again, we can restore we can restore these waterways and make them a lot more resilient to all sorts of disasters. So, what is it that we want to um, do a call out to religious institutes? And I think Sally. Um, this, this slide is just a thought provoking to uh, those of you working on your Laudato Sea plans to consider disaster and a disaster response and resilience um, actions within your Laudato Sea plans. And it is also about uh, incorporating uh, landscape restoration into our Laudato Sea plans. And, and Sally and I and our Ecology Alliance Committee sees that this could be done collaboratively and forming strongly the Alliance, Ecology Alliance across CRA. And I just love that this is a, a lighthouse project and the beginning of the thinking that uh, the Mercies have done as first responders in this community of uh, cry of the earth and cry of the poor or cry of those made poor by this disaster is something really exciting. And, and that, that leadership in our integral ecology thinking uh, 
uh, Sally, as a mercy is just beautiful. And uh, so I love that in your ecological literacy, which is one of the Laudato Sea goals, the Mercy Institute of ISMA PNG knows that this is the right place to be putting your attention. And uh, it's the ask is if others could support us as uh, uh, this project and maybe think about um, being first responders when this disasters like this happen again. We know we're going into uh, El Nino, so we're probably going into a drought um, sort of uh, weather patterns, but fire, flood um, will come. And these rain bombs and the drought bombs, like those uh, drying will come. So if we can help our landscape and, and listen to the cry of the earth, uh, it, it's something that Sally and I are so passionate about mm -hmm. and it's just sharing that passion uh, with you all. Uh, so Sally, what else? Well, if anyone would be interested in reaching out to us, our emails are on the screen and we would love to hear from you. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we did it!